Good morning. We're glad to have you with us in our Bible study of Jeremiah chapter 38. We are appreciative for your interest in the word that brings you here. And let us begin by prayer. We do thank you, O God, and praise you for your mercy, your kindness to us. O Lord, we live in a world of confusion and sin, and we see in your Bible that innocent people like Jeremiah were often carried away in the midst of difficult circumstances and had to live their lives in what we would think were next to impossible conditions. But as we see you sustaining him, help us to remember that you sustain us and strengthen us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Jeremiah 38. Jeremiah 38, verses 1 through 6. The, and by the way, there are questions before we read the text, there are questions about the relationship between Jeremiah 37 and Jeremiah 38. Are they different accounts, slightly different accounts of the same event, or are they two different episodes? Uh, personally, I would favor the latter, that these are two different episodes, but they both show us the people's refusal to listen to Jeremiah and Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah, a prophet of God, be mistreated and rejected. But in this chapter, we will see this very plainly. In verse, verses 1 through 6, in this section, the officials conspire against Jeremiah. Let's give you just a broad overview. And there are some notes for those watching on Facebook more extensively placed on uh, my page. Officials conspire against Jeremiah in verses 1 through 6. Ebed Melech will rescue Jeremiah in verses 7 through 13. Then in verses 14 through 16, Zedekiah vows that he will not put Jeremiah to death. In verses 17 through 23, Jeremiah begs Zedekiah the king to surrender to the Babylonians, but he, he will not. In verses 24 through 28, Zedekiah instructs Jeremiah as to how to answer the officials about their conversation. Now, I recognize that is not uh, the best job of writing, but hope that helps you keep in mind what we're talking about. Jeremiah 38, 1 through 6. Shephatiah, the son of Matan, and Gedaliah, the son of Pasher, Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, and Pasher, the son of Malchijah, heard the words that Jeremiah was speaking to all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, He who stays in this city will die by sword or by and by famine and by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans will live and have his own life as booty and stay alive. Thus says the Lord, this city will certainly be given into the hands of the army of the king of Babylon, and he will capture it. Now the official said to the king, Now let this man be put to death. Inasmuch as he is discouraging the men of war who are left in this city and all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the well-being of the people, but rather their harm. Then King Zedekiah said, Behold, he is in your hands. The king can do nothing against you. Then they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malchijah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guardhouse. And they let Jeremiah down with ropes. Now in the cistern there was no water, but only mud, and Jeremiah sank into the mud. So here we see the opposition to the prophet Jeremiah by some of the highest officials of King Zedekiah. These would have been the last days 
of the kingdom of Judah around 587 B.C. And the text tells us, it gives us the names of the officials in Jeremiah 31 verse 8. Now two of these officials we have seen before. Two of these officials we have seen. For example, Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, is the same man mentioned in Jeremiah 37 verse 3, Jehukal, the son of Shelemiah. The name Pasher, son of Malchijah, was mentioned earlier in Jeremiah chapter 21 in verse 1. Now it's interesting that both of these high-ranking officials of the kings, both of these high-ranking officials of King Zedekiah have been sent before to Jeremiah to say to Jeremiah, please inquire of the Lord for us. If you think it was harsh that Jeremiah gave such a strong answer that you're going to fall, if you think that's harsh, remember what these people are doing here. Even some of the best that the king is sending, saying, please pray for these people, they are plotting to put Jeremiah to death. Constantly in the Old Testament, the people of God reject the messengers of God. And as we will state later, Lord willing, that rejection ultimately foreshadows events in the New Testament, the rejection of Jesus and His messengers. But these officials hear Jeremiah speaking. Now His message is stated in verses 2 and 3. His message stated in verses 2 and 3 is worded a very, in a very similar way to Jeremiah 21 verses 8 and 9. But in Jeremiah 28, 2 and 3, he who stays in the city will die. Will die by sword, famine, and pestilence. But if you go out to the Chaldeans, you will live. Because this city is going to be captured by the king of Babylon. That is his message. Now, think about it just a moment. If you were a military leader and you were trying to encourage your soldiers to stay and be brave and fight, would you be angry at that message? I'm not saying this in defense of those military leaders. I am saying, would we do any better? Would we do any better? Jeremiah's message is from God. And I want you to notice how frequently in this chapter that is called attention to. Jeremiah is claiming this in verse 2, Thus says the Lord. In verse 3, Thus says the Lord. Jeremiah speaks a message from God. And the people and the leaders are not listening. In verse 4, the officials said to the king, Now let this man be put to death. Let them be put to death. Inasmuch as he is discouraging the men of war who are left in this city and all the people by speaking such words to them, for he is not seeking the welfare, the peace of this people, but rather their harm, rather their evil. These people want to put to death the prophet of God. And notice how death looms over all of this chapter, particularly for Jeremiah. These officials who have heard Jeremiah preach his message this city is going to be given in the hands of the king of Babylon and he will capture it. So you need to go out and surrender to the Babylonians and you will live. But if you stay in this city, you will die. The officials who hear this say, you need to put this man to death, King Zedekiah. He is speaking evil of the people. He is not seeking their good. He is seeking their harm. You need, you need to um, put him to death. Zedekiah is going to appear in this chapter as incredibly weak. 
Notice in verse 5, Zedekiah says, the king can do nothing. I, I can't oppose you. The king can do nothing. He's in your hands. And so they take Jeremiah and they threw him into a cistern. In verse 6, you see that phrase cistern or that, or that uh, expression in the cistern or into the cistern used a couple of times. Uh, by the way, just as Joseph's brothers threw him into a pit in Genesis chapter 37, the same word used for Joseph's pit is used for Jeremiah's cistern, drawing links between these particular events. But Jeremiah is lowered down in this cistern by ropes and the text tells us that there was no water in the cistern but mud and Jeremiah sinks in the mud. So as the prophet is sitting here in the mud at the bottom of this cistern, he is in a situation where it is impossible for him to be left out, to, to him to be to get out on his own, to be let out uh, with no help from others. Didn't construct that sentence well, but you get the idea. These men have said to King Zedekiah, he needs to die, and they put him in a position where they expect that to happen. But I want you to notice the striking contrast between these high officials of the king and the actions of the king in letting these men do this, I want you to notice that contrast with Ebed Melech. Ebed Melech, his name means servant of the king. I also want you to notice how often it is said that Ebed Melech is an Ethiopian or a Cushite. That is said in verse 7. In verse 10 and verse 12, his nationality is a big part of this story. But in verse 7, Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, a eunuch, when he was in the king's palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the cistern. Now the king was sitting in the gate of Benjamin. And Ebed Melech went out from the king's palace and spoke to the king, saying, My lord the king, these men have acted wickedly in all they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the cistern, and he will die right where he is because of the famine, for there is no more bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, Take thirty men from here under your authority and bring up Jeremiah the prophet from the cistern before he dies. So Ebed Melech took the men under his authority and went into the king's palace to a place beneath the storeroom and took from there worn out clothes and worn out rags and let them down by ropes into the cistern to Jeremiah. Then Ebed Melech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, Now put these worn out clothes and rags under your armpits and under the ropes. And Jeremiah did so. So they pulled Jeremiah up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah stayed in the court of the guardhouse. The evil that the officials of Zedekiah plotted against him, plotted against Jeremiah in verses 1 through 6, contrast with Ebed Melech who rescues him. It's a complete contrast. And Ebed Melech is a foreigner. You would have expected things to be the other way around. You would have expected the officials of Judah to be more open to the Word of God than a person who was a foreigner. But that is not the case in uh, the land of Israel at this time. But he heard, Ebed Melech heard that the king Zedekiah, he had cast Jeremiah into this cistern. And he goes to the king and he says to the king, My lord, these men have acted wickedly against Jeremiah the prophet. You notice 
how he speaks of Jeremiah as a prophet, both in verses 9 and 10. He knows that Jeremiah is a spokesman of God and that his words are true. He says, these men have acted wickedly in what they have done to Jeremiah, and they have put him into this cistern. And at the bottom of this cistern, he's going to die of this famine because there is no bread in the city. And it would be a terrible way to die just to be put at the bottom of a cistern that had no water uh, where simply your feet were in the mud and to wait there until you starve to death. And that is what the officials plotted against Jeremiah. And that is what Ebed melech wants to rescue Jeremiah from. Zedekiah hears this and he agrees. Zedekiah is portrayed in this chapter, as I stated, as incredibly weak. In verse 5, he told the officials he couldn't do anything to stop them in their persecution of Jeremiah. In verse 10, when ebed melech wants to rescue Jeremiah, Zedekiah says, go, take 30 men. Now, a couple of manuscripts have three men. It may be that 30 men, which is the more common reading, it may have been that this would have uh, shown that in spite of any opposition, we're going to rescue Jeremiah. Take 30 men with you from here and bring them to Jeremiah the prophet before he dies. And so they took men, uh, ebed melech took the men with him. He finds worn out ropes and worn out rags to lift Jeremiah out of the pit. Jeremiah is an old man uh, who has spoken the word of the Lord for a long time. ebed melech first and foremost rescues Jeremiah, bold enough to go to the king, the king who has sentenced him to this fate, and to say, King, you haven't, this, this is not right. We need to rescue him. And he's considerate enough, he's careful enough, he pays enough attention to detail to make sure that this trip for Jeremiah and pulling him out of the cistern is as painless as possible. And the Bible says that he instructs Jeremiah, put these worn out clothes, worn out rags under your armpits. And they pulled Jeremiah up with the ropes and let him out of the cistern, and Jeremiah stayed in the court of the guardhouse. Now I want you to think about these two scenes back to back. Look at that contrast. The officials of Judah conspire against Jeremiah and want him to be put to death. But in verses 7 through 13, ebed melech the Ethiopian, wants to rescue Jeremiah. Contrast the rejection of this message by God's people to the mercy shown by a foreigner. Now, this isn't the only time in the Bible this happens. Let me encourage you to uh, make a mental note or turn to, if that is, if you have the capability to do so, Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 24. In Luke 4, 24, Jesus is preaching and teaching in his hometown synagogue at Nazareth. And he says, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. And he gives two illustrations of that. I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah. When the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. In verse 27, And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. So what you see in these verses... In 1 Kings chapter 17, the days of Elijah, when there was a famine in the land, there were a lot of widows in Israel. 
a lot of widows in Israel, but Elijah wasn't sent to any of them. Elijah was sent to a widow in Zarephath, a woman who dwelt in the region that Jezebel was raised. He was sent to a foreigner at this time when there were many widows in Israel to choose from. And in the same way, there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha. But one that we know of was cleansed was Naaman, who was an Aramean soldier. What Jesus is doing here is illustrating that a prophet is not received with honor in his own country. Elijah wasn't, Elisha wasn't, and he isn't. And often this message which is rejected by those we would think most likely to listen is accepted by those that we would think least likely to listen. Now Jesus could have used this illustration from Jeremiah 38. It makes this exact same point, the same point of 1 Kings 17, the same point of 2 Kings 5. It shows us a time when those that we would think most likely to listen to the Word of God reject it, that some of those least likely to listen would accept it. And I would tell you, that's been my experience in preaching and teaching, whether it be in talking to the world or talking to local churches, that that is often the experience, the, what I have seen as well. So in these passages, the officials conspire against Jeremiah, but ebed melech rescues Jeremiah. Now, in verses 14 through 28, kind of the second section, of this chapter. Zedekiah is going to vow to Jeremiah not to put him to death, but Jeremiah is going to present to Zedekiah the two alternatives in this case. You can go out and surrender to the Babylonians or you can stay in the city. But he tells them the consequences of both. And let's read this in verses 14 through 23. Jeremiah 38, verses 14 through 23. King Zedekiah sent and had Jeremiah the prophet brought to him at the third entrance that is in the house of the Lord. And the king said to Jeremiah, I'm going to ask you something. Do not hide it from me. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, If I tell you, will you certainly, will you not certainly put me to death? Besides, if I give you advice, you will not listen. He said, if I tell you what the Lord wants me to tell you, you'll kill me. And if I tell you what the Lord wants me to tell you, you're not going to listen anyway. In verse 16, King Zedekiah swore to Jeremiah in secret, saying, As the Lord lives, who made this life for us, surely I will not put you to death, nor will I give you into the hand of these men who are seeking your life. Jeremiah says, if I tell you, you're going to put me to death. Zedekiah vows, I will not put you to death. I am not going to do that. And I am not going to give you into the hands of those men who want you to die. The men described in chapter 38, verses 1 through 6. He said, I'm not going to give you into their hands. Notice what he doesn't vow. He doesn't vow he'll listen to God. Verse 17. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, If you indeed go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then you will live. This city will not be burned with fire, and you and your household will survive. But if you will not go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then this city will be given over into the hand of the Chaldeans and they will burn it with fire and you yourself will not escape from their hand. Then King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, I dread the Jews who have gone over to the Chaldeans 
for they may give me over into their hand, and they will abuse me. But Jeremiah said, They will not give you over. Please obey the Lord in what I am saying to you, that it may go well with you and that you may live. But if you keep refusing to go out, this is the word which the Lord has shown me. Then behold, all of the women who have been left in the palace of the king of Judah are going to be brought out to the officers of the king of Babylon. And those women will say, Your close friends have misled you and overpowered you while your feet have been sunk into the mire. They turn back. They will also bring out all your wives and your sons to the Chaldeans, and you yourself will not escape from their hands, but will be seized by the hand of the king of Babylon, and this city will be burned with fire. So after Zedekiah says, you tell me what the Lord has to say, and I won't put you to death. After this, Jeremiah presents to Zedekiah the two alternatives that he had presented earlier in this chapter, in verses 2 and 3. Go out to the Babylonians, surrender to the Babylonians, and live. Stay in this city, and you will meet death and destruction. Jeremiah gives to Zedekiah the king these two options. In verse 17, if you will go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then you will live, and this city will not be burned and you and your household will survive. That is not to say that Zedekiah doesn't face difficulties either way. It is to say this is the best alternative. This is the better alternative. Go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, surrender, and you and your house will live. But the other possibility is in verse 18. The other possibility, if you will not go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then this city will be given in the hands of the Chaldeans and they will burn it with fire and you yourself will not escape from their hands. Go out and surrender to the king of Babylon and you will live. But if you don't go out, this city is going to be given into the hands of the Chaldeans they will burn it with fire and you will not escape. Notice in verse 17, if Zedekiah listens, the city will not be burned with fire. But in verse 18, if he doesn't listen, it will be burned with fire. The fate of this city is tied to the response of the king. The king is leading the people in the right response in this, or should be leading the people in this right response. But Zedekiah objects to Jeremiah's message. I am afraid if I go out and surrender to the king of Babylon, I'm afraid if I go out and surrender to him that he will hand me over to those Jews who have already surrendered and they will abuse me. And Jeremiah says, they will not give you over. Now Jeremiah is giving Zedekiah a promise. Zedekiah has promised Jeremiah earlier, I'm not going to put you to death. Jeremiah is saying, if you do that, the king of Babylon is not going to give you over into the hands of those who are seeking your life. He's not going to do it. And he makes an appeal in verse 20. Please obey the Lord in what I'm saying to you. Please obey the Lord that it may go well with you and you may live. You remember before the officials of the king told the king, this man's not seeking the welfare of the people. He's not seeking the peace, the good of this people. He's seeking to harm, to do evil to this people. Is that true of this prophet? This prophet gives an unpopular message, and I can understand my people would be alarmed at it. But it's God's word. It's God's message. And he wants the best for the people. He is begging Zedekiah, who has allowed him to be thrown in that cistern, 
earlier in this chapter, he is begging him, please obey. Please obey the Lord that it may go well with you. Please obey. Sometimes a preacher's or a teacher's strong warning, a parent's strong warning, may not be because they don't love you, but because they do. And they want to spare you from disaster. Please obey the Lord that it may go well with you. Jeremiah views his message as the Lord's message. His words as the Lord's words. Please obey the Lord. You're saying you're afraid of what the king is going to do and hand you over to these people. Obey the Lord. It's ultimately an issue between Zedekiah and God. But he says, to make things abundantly clear, in verses 21 through 23, he spells out the consequences again. The consequences that will transpire if you do not surrender to the king of Babylon. If you keep refusing, one day all of these women who are left in your palace are going to be brought out and they're going to be added to the harem of the officers of the king of Babylon. And they're going to lament and they're going to dir sing a dirge and wonder why it is all your enemies have forsaken you. He says that's going to happen if you don't surrender to the king of Babylon. And all your wives and all your sons are going to be given to the Chaldeans. And you will not escape. And this city will be burned with fire. God leaves Zedekiah in no doubt as to which way is the way he should choose. Surrender to the Babylonians and live. Stay in this city and meet all of these disasters. Your wives, your sons, and your women in your palace will all be given into the hand of the king of Babylon and you will not escape. The city will not escape. God is setting before Zedekiah life and death and blessing and cursing. Friend, if you've been listening, there isn't any one of you who are listening who cannot read verses 17 through 23, or if you've listened carefully, heard these words, and are any or there's not any of you who are in any doubt as to what God wanted of Zedekiah. And yet he's not going to do it. Often we reject the Bible not because of difficult statements that are hard to understand intellectually, but plain statements, clear statements, where God tells us what to do and we just don't want to listen. As the chapter ends, Zedekiah is more concerned about his officials than he is about God. And he tells in verse 24, Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, let no man know about these words and you will not die. But if the officials hear that I have talked with you and come to you and say to you, tell us now what you said to the king and what the king said to you, do not hide it from us and we will not put you to death, then you are to say to them, I was presenting my petition before the king not to make me return to the house of Jonathan to die there. Then all the officials came to Jeremiah and questioned him. And so he reported to them in accordance with all these words which the king had commanded. And they ceased speaking with him since the conversation had not been overheard. So Jeremiah stayed in the court of the guardhouse until the day that Jerusalem 
was captured. Zedekiah said, don't tell anyone these words or, and you will not die. Um, it's interesting, he already promised him in 14 through 16 he wouldn't die. And now he adds another condition. But when the officials say, what did he say to you? He says, well, I was making a petition not to return to the house of Jonathan, which he did in chapter 37 in verses 17 through 21. The king says, you tell them that. Jeremiah does this and uh, he stays in apparently a better prison until the day Jerusalem was captured. Should Jeremiah have done this? I want you to understand the fact it's recorded doesn't mean necessarily he did right or wrong. The Bible often records events and we have to evaluate them based upon the rest of the revelation that he has given. Let me sum up some main ideas in this chapter. One is that quite frequently Jeremiah has been shown to speak a message from God. Sometimes this is because he says, thus says the Lord. Sometimes it's because he is called the prophet. And sometimes it's because he just out and out says, this, word, this is the word the Lord has shown me. You see that idea in Jeremiah 38, verse 2, verse 3, verse 9, verse 10, verse 14, verse 17, verse 20 and 21. Jeremiah speaks a message from God. Death cast its dark shadow over this chapter. Now Jeremiah warns the people that they need to surrender to the Babylonians or they will die by sword, famine, and pestilence in verse 2. And in verse 17... Jeremiah encourages Zedekiah to go out to the king of Babylon and he will live. So life and death, that decision faces the people in Jerusalem. But generally in this chapter, when there is a mention about someone being put to death or dying, it is usually in regard to Jeremiah the prophet. You see that in verse 4 verse 9, verse 10, verses 15 and 16, and then in verse 17, and each of the verses, 24, 25, 26, all of those verses show us that Jeremiah is threatened with death. He speaks God's message, but he is threatened with death. Let me tell you this. The Old Testament rejection of Jeremiah and prophets like him, all of this foreshadow and prepare us for the rejection and crucifixion of Christ. If you want to look on my Facebook page, you will see a reference to New Testament passages that make this abundantly clear. But let me notice one of them. In Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7, in Acts chapter 7, in verse 52, Stephen says to those listening to him, which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. Your fathers persecuted and killed those who announced the coming of the Messiah. And now you are murderers of the Messiah. The rejection of people like Jeremiah prepares the way for the rejection of Christ.
This particular word, pit or cistern, which is used about seven times, I believe, from verses 6 through 13. I stated earlier it was a word used of Joseph in Genesis 37. It was also used of Joseph in his experience at the hands of the Egyptians in Genesis 40, verse 15, in Genesis 41, verse 14. But what's interesting about this particular Hebrew word is it's often a synonym for death or Sheol. And again, on my notes, I give you some passages that demonstrate that. Psalm 30, verse 3, Psalm 88, verse 4, and verse 6, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 12, Isaiah 5, 14, and a whole host of passages in Ezekiel 32, beginning with verse 17. I give you some more in the notes online, but, but that is sufficient. The word that is used for the pit into which Jeremiah is cast, the word that's used for that pit is used for death and Sheol. In a very real sense, they were carrying out their sentence. This man deserves to die. They put him there fully intending to kill him but he is lifted out of this pit. He is rescued from this near-death experience. When Jeremiah is rescued from this near-death experience in Jeremiah 38, it is a foreshadowing of the resurrection of Jesus. Just as his persecution and rejection and them trying to sentence him to death foreshadows the death and resurrection of Jesus. So, in this case, lifting him out of the pit, a place associated with death and Sheol, is a foreshadowing of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus are the central, effect, central facts of history, and of Scripture, and it should not surprise us that they are constantly foreshadowed in the revelation that God has given through Moses and through the prophets of the Old Testament. Thank you for listening. God bless you and keep you.